Okay, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Lauren Weinstein. So Lauren, as many of you know, has been a comics maker for some 20 years. And her work has been featured in The New Yorker, The New York Times, Slate, Book Forum, Nautilus, and The Guardian, and I have to say Mother Magazine, which is my magazine. And since 2019, she's been the artist in residence at Town Clock CDC, teaching art to the survivors that live there. Her comic, The Gift of Time, was featured on Slate.com. That's about that work and something she's going to be speaking about today. Her acclaimed comic series, Normal Person, was the last weekly strip to run in the Village Voice. Um, her work, Being an Artist and a Mother, won the Slate Cartoonist Studio Prize and was published in the Best American Comics in 2019. And she has a beautiful book, Mother's Walk, which is a visceral meditation on the ramifications of childbirth. Um, and it, was, it ran in Frontier. All of that work is actually being sold by Lauren over at the Saw booth as well. And she may have some of the work to show you today. And I want to let Lauren just take over now because she has a prepared talk that she's going to give. And then she and I are going to chat a bit at the end, depending on time, and then open it up to the audience. So do you know, write your questions down, and we'll get back to you. All right, come on up. All right. Hi, everybody. Oh, it is, I'm so glad to be here, especially just connecting with real human beings. Um, originally, I was supposed to give this talk at um, ICON, this illustration conference in Kansas City, and I got COVID two days before, which was made it so that I video, I like recorded this whole talk and then sent it over there, and they actually played it. So I've changed it a little bit, but I, it's extra great to be here talking to you all now. Um, so my talk is about this idea of art and life. It's all the same thing, but what does that mean? And for me, it's really evolved. Um, I'll start at the beginning. In 2019, right before the pandemic, I had the good fortune of interviewing Aileen kaminsky Crum on stage at the Comic Arts, at Comic Arts Brooklyn right before, well, I said right before the pandemic. We are both confessional cartoonists, and she is unflinching in her portrayal of reality. And I felt like she had a lot to teach. And so she told me four things about the practice of art that have really inspired me. And the first is like, have some kind of uh, exercise practice. And first it's for vanity, but then maybe it'll save your life as you get older. And then the next one was listen to dreams. And for her, this was like a very concrete thing. Um, she had this, car this dream about this cartoonist Spain who told her that she was really sick. And then the next day she found out she had cancer. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm really bad at remembering. How many people can remember their dreams? Are you guys like good at, oh, well. Okay, so most of you guys are better at me than remembering your dreams. But so I, I've, I have, redefined that idea of just being open to whatever comes my way. So I can be present and open when I'm in a situation to say, hey, this might make a good piece of art. Um, and I feel like that's maybe your job as, a, as a, a cartoonist that makes comics about yourself and other people is keeping your antenna up for these serendipitous moments that might become something else when they, they're committed to paper. And this leads me into the big thing that she said, which is that life and art, it's all the same thing. Um, and I thought about this over and over and over again, like what does that really mean? And for me, the meaning changes with different projects. Oh, she said one more thing, and the last thing is a surprise. So uh, 12 years ago, actually, almost 13 now, when I had my first kid, I set up a binary in my mind, either be an artist or a parent. And that tension of finding uninterrupted time to focus on art versus the time and space that parenting took up physically and mentally gradually made me crazy. And this was the best case scenario. I'd just like to pause for a second and say this is the best, this craziness is what I wanted. I wanted kids. I wasn't forced by anybody else to have kids. I chose this life and my husband has health insurance and I can only imagine what it's like for people 
that don't have that. Um, but for me, the only way to move forward was to embrace life's messiness and break down the barriers between life and art completely. Because the pure, uninterrupted studio time, the life of the artist alone somewhere creating work just does not exist, both alone and online. Uh, this comic was originally done for the Village Voice. So one of the big, uh, the first comic that I did um, was called Being an Artist and a Mother that really had the overlap of art and life. Here it is. I saw this painting on Twitter and I had one of those singular art viewing experiences where the work jumps across time and space to define some shared human truth. Here's a sideline nursing mom, just like me, in that one nursing pose that allows you both to totally relax. The mom's big hands that do everything are at rest, turned inward. Look at how the baby fits against the mother's body. Compare this painting with all the Madonna and child paintings facing outward, overly romanticized, often with little baby men in their laps. Why haven't I ever seen this painting before? It's revolutionary. Wait. Actually, I had seen this painting before. It had, I just never noticed it. I'd had a catalog of Paula Motorson Becker since art school, and it's just been lying in my basement for years. Damn it, the painting is right here. How could I have not seen this painting in art school? At that point, I promised myself I'd never have kids for fear it would end my artistic career. I loved Motorson Becker's sense of color and her handling of paint, but it was better to be blind to her subjects. But now, all I can see are her drawings of women and children, unsentimental and clear. And it turned out that the reason why that painting had been on Twitter in the first place was because this other art author loved her so much and she'd had much the same feeling. Holy shit, she was the first woman to paint herself naked, that historians noticed, and that was in 1906, and she painted herself looking pregnant, but she wasn't? Paula left her husband to go to Paris and do her art, but then she had a change of heart and she got pregnant. And she had really, really, really mixed feelings about uh, being a mom. Then she had her baby. It was a hard birth. They wouldn't let her out of bed afterward. 18 days later, she died of an embolism in her leg. Ever since I got pregnant with my first child eight years ago, now 12, I've been on a mission to record the fleeting growth and change of becoming a mother as a retroactive message to my art school self that says, you don't disappear. But unless you can pay, often you don't have access to your hands. It was until my husband went back to work after his week of paternity leave that I really saw the vast chasm of the gender gap. Overnight, I became financially dependent upon him and then continued to blame myself for not maximizing my meager hours of babysitting time. And then I got a great freelance job, and then that fizzled out, and then things got dark. How do you connect and observe and create at the same time? And I just keep thinking about this over and over again. I don't know. Paula, how would you have managed it? You seem so conflicted about becoming a mom you only sold three paintings in your short life. Would you have kept working had you survived? What, you, what would you have shown us as the postpartum subject? And how many more other Motorsen Beckers are there out there? So then in this comic, I talk about relatability, you know, <laughs> uh, and, and you just wonder how much more unrelatable art there is that's not put out there in some way. And then finally, I go to the MoMA to see Paula right out in front of all of her, hanging alongside all of her, her peers. And I get this sinking feeling. It's one of her last uh, paintings done when she was uh, pregnant in 1907. What was she thinking? 
I wish she'd been able to paint more. But then I have to fucking go because I have to take my kid out of the museum. Miwa, Abi. So um, I'm always trying to balance life and art with life and ki with, with my kids. And it seemed, especially during the pandemic when we were stuck at home for almost two years, the most practical solution was to make art and life the same. I would always be on the hunt for those moments that stick out. Again, it's like that antenna being up. And I would record their lives for what I felt were historical purposes. I would do these drawings in 20 minute increments while I had Sylvia in virtual preschool. <laughs> Here she is waiting to get called on. <laughs> School did not always go so well. But it was so comforting and cathartic that if you treated everything you did like it was art, then life in general would be more beautiful and compelling even if you weren't making any art. No one ever left. And I was miserable because it was so hard to finish anything. But it was comforting to think that if everything was art, then the piles of toys and excess dog hair was all part of the process. And cleaning and folding laundry was like making a tableau. And on the flip side, if real life was an artistic practice, then gardening was the ultimate art. Even homegrown salad could be a masterpiece. But really, who the fuck cares about my salads? So I did this piece about my eldest getting sick at the beginning of the pandemic for The New Yorker. But I ran into a problem in writing comics about myself. I've always felt that I can share most anything but sharing about how my kid got sick felt like I'd crossed a line. What, right, what do you have the right to disclose, especially if the person is a minor and is your kid? How willing a collaborator can your kid ever be in your art? How can you deal with a situation, be present for a kid, if you're constantly weaving a story about their lives in your mind? And is making art about one's own life healing? Healing for who? Cathartic for who? Or is it just making a performance about something that happened to dissociate from it? And is that OK? But I felt like a boundary needed to be drawn. Art and life were not the same here, and my kid needed to be shielded. So for many years, I've had this book deal to write a memoir about my childhood, but I've never been able to commit to finishing it. And this was just another situation where uh, I, got, I got this project right before the pandemic, which was to um, write about, write and draw and be with other people uh, and write about their lives and teach them to draw comics. And I couldn't pass it down because my antenna like went way up for it. So <clears throat> here's a little bit about that project. It's my first night meeting at Town Clock. Must be weird having graves on your lawn. It's November 2019. I feel anxious and depressed about my country. This is a chance to act and combine the two things that I've done for my entire adult life, teaching art and making comics. And if I suck at it, it'll be over in a year. So this is the executive director of this place. And I say, this, is a, this building is beautiful. It's amazing, the history. And she says, you mean the fire? Yeah, it was right here. In 1971, a man came here looking for his ex, who the church was protecting. She was cleaning the church to give back, and he came in looking for her, and he set this place on fire. And the sanctuary was never properly repaired. So when I became a pastor here around 2000, we began to think about how to rededicate the space. And we said maybe God was trying to tell us something. Maybe we need to house survivors of domestic violence. And um, this place is really special because unlike most shelters that house uh, domestic violence survivors, they house their short term, they house survivors for about six months, but this place is long term, so it provides unlimited long term housing. And it gave me a chance to really follow the women that I was working with. So I could stay there a year, two years, and now it's three years. 
part of my job will be to get to know the women, interview them, and make a comic about their lives. Am I up to the task? Will they trust me? Will I do right by them by retelling their stories? Will teaching them art help anything? I did a 30-page comic called The Gift of Time that follows the life of two survivors of domestic abuse. And it turns out that comics are the perfect medium to talk about survivors because you can conceal people's identities. All the survivors that I am showing you are a little different from in real life, and that allows everyone to be safe and comfortable. And it also allowed them to be more candid. And this fiction was really important. So for the first workshop, um, the, the social worker that worked there, she was like, let's do comics, superheroes. And I was like, corny, so corny. Um, but uh, I had some really interesting results. Um, one of the women there, Svetlana, um, she that was this amazing renderer, and she invented a superhero alter ego who was an abuser slayer. And I thought, wow, she could be like a concept artist for Marvel. But then she was like, no way, I can't do this. It turned out that she was worried that somehow her picture of this abuser slayer would be used as evidence against her character in court and result in her losing custody of her kid. And later, this constant stress made her drop the class. But as I began to teach more workshops, I began to see the women having the same catharsis as I sometimes do when I make a comic about my own life. Here's an example. I don't know if you, how many of you guys are familiar with Ivan Brunetti, but he has this exercise where you draw yourself five minutes, three minutes, and then one minute. And it's to kind of get the essence of yourself as a, uh, from a, an, drawing to cartooning. Um, but this woman, Daraja, she um, did a completely different thing. She says, um, it, this is me when I first came to America. This is me when I had my baby alone in the hospital. And this is me now, and I am here, and by the grace of God, things will get better. So I was in way over my head. <laughs> um, uh, but this assignment opened up this whole way for her to talk about her past, and it was incredible. Um, she, she came from a really small village in Africa, and she was a nurse, um, and she wanted to go to America. She won a green card lottery, and she wanted to come to America to get training to build a clinic back in her home back at home. Right before she got, uh, she left, she got married and got pregnant, and she couldn't conceive of the world's richest country not having a robust childcare system. That's why she could just, thought she could go to America and learn all this stuff. But when she got to America, um, some people actually enslaved her, and um, it was this pregnancy that saved her life. She had a six-month OBGYN appo uh, appointment, and the doctor knew something was wrong, and she ended up telling the doctor what had happened, and from there, she came to town clock. But through these, collecting these women's stories, it feels like the aftermath of being in an abusive situation and um, is, is almost easy, uh, it feels like the aftermath is almost as traumatic when you're dealing with all of the broken systems of, of America. And um, it's my hope that these stories kind of can tell bigger ones. Um, like just this one about trying to get cheap corn. But then, you know, the antenna goes up again and there are these little just golden moments with her. Uh, how, how do you do it with your kids in your career? She says, I need strength. You must be a superhero. And I say, no, I'm crazy. I just work all the time. But that I should have said, no, I just have childcare. But she doesn't want to talk about those things. She wants to make art. 
And so I haven't left, and I keep making art, uh, help, helping the women paint and draw and do whatever the hell they want to do. And it's really fun. Um, and here is uh, Daraja in front of the Chamber of Commerce with all of her art. And she makes these beautiful paintings she'd never painted before. And she makes these works that kind of recollect what her life was like before. She almost has like a weird photographic memory or something. Like she can just kind of put this work out there. And it, like, how did she know how to draw a reflection of trees? I don't know. It's amazing. We got a grant um, to go to uh, the Met. And um, Daraja, uh, we saw the Alice Neal show. And Alice Neal is also a, a survivor of, of domestic abuse. And I felt like this would be a great entry place for the women to see the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And Daraja just went forward and touched the art. And, and both the executive director and I like reached out to grab her hand to say no, no. And she was really freaked out. She's like, why are these women grabbing my hand? It was, she perceived it as like a you know, violent act almost. And I just realized she'd never been in a situation where there was any situation, any separation between life and art. Why, why, was, why was the whole thing constructed this way? And it, it just made me think about everything so differently. And then one woman um, who was trafficked from the Middle East stood in front of a painting and said, how did this work get here? And then she said, one day I will go back home. And man, I just, I see museums in a completely different way now. It's just a completely, I, yeah. <laughs> uh, she felt displaced and much like the art. And I've never felt that displacement. So, and here's some of her art. She makes these gorgeous big paintings. So, all oh, this stuff has helped me get back to work on my graphic novel. Uh, the idea that I had to build a fiction around these women to make them comfortable with the process has helped me kind of build a fiction around my own life. But it's also helped me look back um, with a little bit of perspective. And um, so, and I'm trying not to beat myself up, like if I need to um, put a, draw a moon, I'll just cut out a picture of the moon <laughs> and glue it on, because it looks great. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, I grew up thinking we lived in a post-feminist society and that I was free but now it's obvious that there's so much work to do, and I'm, through reliv reliving these things in the past, I'm able to look a little more clearly at the present. Like this page about trying to get in with the cool girls, but still wanting to be with the uh, really creepy guy. This story is about my bat mitzvah, and it helps that my eldest daughter is going through her bat mitzvah at the same time. And if you know me right now, I will be rolling around on the floor with stress about planning for her bat mitzvah. But it's allowing me to kind of relive my own bat mitzvah and all the things that were really, really tough about it and thinking about my uh, relationship with spirituality and religion, and my bat mitzvah was kind of the birth of my atheism, but also my um, birth as an artist. And the party did not go so well. <laughs> Everybody inhaled in helium balloons, and then we all slam danced and broke up the par parquet floor. Um, so anyway, here's the end, uh, serendipity. The last thing that Aileen Kaminsky Crum said was, don't worry about endings. The ending will seem fake. If you force it, the end will find you. So the final story I'm going to tell walks the, the border between art and life. I have been teaching art to the residents of Town Clock for three years. And I told you Svetlana quit the class because she was real stressed out. And she said, I'm just going to be a hairstylist. I'm no good. Um, and I'm not good enough to be a real artist. 
she got hung up on finishing things. And my background is in teaching college, and I feel like I'm very into having people finishing things. Um, and wait a second. Um, because that's the only way you can evaluate yourself, and finishing things is like pulling cancer out of your body. But um, that is not how everybody at Town Clock sees it, because they're just like trying to make art for fun. Um, and so I needed to change my process. And um, the resident therapist at Town Clock, Dr. Debbie, suggested another approach, which would be do a, doing a monoprint workshop, where m making mistakes was kind of like part of the deal. Um, but we needed these plates, and they were expensive. They're called jelly plates. So. At the very same time, uh, there, I had local artist friends saying that, said that there is this woman artist that died in my community, and could all the artist teachers come and like clean out her, uh, her studio? And I was like, oh, okay, sure. Um, and it was insanity. Um, there are Pez dispensers everywhere. Uh, 3,800 rubber stamps that had been cataloged from flat fire files, and a man was hauling them out in a truck. <laughs> and then there were tons of um, paints and inks, and I felt like a jackal gathering whatever I could. And um, there were the jelly plates in the corner. I grabbed them for that thing that De Dr. Debbie. So we made a, an appointment to do the, the mono print workshop. Um, and then I grabbed all this expensive paper, you know, the kind that you see at Paper Source that's like $30 a sheet, and when you get it, it just sits in your flat file because you have nothing to do with it. It's just so beautiful and perfect. So I brought this paper to Town Clock, and Svetlana happened to be back that week, and she was so thrilled. And she just, and I was like, take it, just take it. And she, so she did. She took bunch of sheets and I, I, I just, and, and it was like she went to a museum just with a stack of paper and she was just delighted and thrilled. And look at her. <laughs> and um, so then Daraja comes in and she just takes all the paper and starts lining it up on the floor and like thinking about how it goes together and all these different patterns, how they work together. And then she starts cutting up the paper and ruining it. <laughs> and, 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 but then she has to stop because she's just been hired on as a nurse. And she has to work out childcare. And she's going to actually get that job. And um, in this moment, I saw heaven. I saw what the afterlife is in a tangible way. A week before, wh whoever this artist was, was alive, and she held on in her studio to all this stuff too tightly. She didn't use it, but now these women would use this paper, and by cutting it and using it, uh, this old owner's memory would live on. Art was this rejuvenating force going through all of us, both in practice and in result. Here's the monoprint workshop. And Svetlana used this paper to make this collage and this box, and she wasn't worried about making mistakes. And that's the end. Thanks. <laughs> oh. And this is $60, but it is uh, for sale at Tom Hart's thing, and all the money goes to Town Clock. So there you go. <laughs> We're just going to go sit down and start talking to each other. So Laura and I were talking before we came in, um, and a lot of topics you brought up in this talk are what I want to go a little more deeply in. Mm -hmm. So you talked about being a confessional cartoonist you know, earlier in your career, but how has your approach and your methods and like your sense of responsibility shifted in comic storytelling as you talk about others' stories, and particularly as it's your own kids? Yeah. I think boundaries are actually what makes <laughs> stories and, and life into art. I actually feel like the boundaries that you make, the terms that you define are gonna make things be safe. And I, I think the more 
those things can be resolved, the better. Um, I do think a memoir, everybody says a memoir is good when you spill a little blood. Mm. Um, and I don't know, everybody? Somebody, somebody told me that. Uh, <laughs> one person? Um. Maybe Aileen again. Was Aileen also like, fourth thing. <laughs> right, right. Well, Get the knife in there. <laughs> and, and I mean, but it's, that makes a good story. Certainly mm -hmm. when you read a story, that those, that's the tension that you're working with. So, so I don't, for me, it's like an ever, I feel like I do need to draw boundaries with my kids. Um, and, and I think that's, there's a lot of artifice that ends up having to, it looks like, you know, you, you're just spitting this stuff out, but you're kind of not because you need to figure out where those boundaries are. And everything about predatory social media makes people feel like they just have to vomit it up. Mm. But I, I just think that that can get you into some pretty bad places. Um, even just the way you think, like nothing is ever enough. Um, so just in terms of boundaries, I think that's where revision comes in. That's mm -hmm. where checking comes in. I mean, I've had to go through so many hoops with Town Clock. I've had to speak to lawyers and, um, and just making sure that the women are okay with it. Like one woman that I work with would never actually sit down for an interview because she just thinks all interviews are interrogations. She thinks that um, to be interviewed actually means that you're gonna be pinned down in some way. Mm -hmm. um, so there's all sorts of ways to approach that. And I think the other thing is to think about what, what your end goal is with spilling your guts. Like, is it just to puke or is it like, is there some bigger story? And it, I, so those are the questions I can ask. I don't, I don't have definitive answers, mm -hmm. but those are things that come up all the time. It gets into something that I wanted to ask you about, which is that art as everyday life can also be art as activism. And do you feel that way in, it's, it's on the surface in your work about Town Clock, mm -hmm. but how do you feel that in all of your work, including your work about you know, parenting as a, as a mother? Um, I feel like, yeah, I mean, why would, I, my mom is an activist, mm -hmm. so I'm like always thinking about that in terms of um, what she does, um, but I, I, I think for me, stories come first, mm -hmm. but the stories that I wanna tell, I mean, so like I had this job working for the Village Voice and I would do a weekly strip every week and I, I felt like I had to be a, you know, a little bit political. It was right when Trump was um, elected. But I, I just, I'm not really a political cartoonist. I feel like I'm a storyteller. So um, this was a way to kind of get at that mm -hmm. without being so explicit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the editor who told you that motherhood is unrelatable, it was interesting to me because I think there's this pressure of the concept of publishing as getting at big stories. Mm -hmm. um, but there is something often there, particularly if people are rushing into it earlier in their career, where that means exploitation in so many cases. Like, yeah. if you approach these subjects and you wanted to get at big stories, you would have told very different stories. Right. 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 So how is everyday life a big story in some ways? Like, how do you approach that when you think about finding the story? Yeah. Well, I mean, every time I walk into town clock, it's a big story. <laughs> like, everything that they deal with mm -hmm. speaks to our systemic failures as a society. Like, it's not, I mean, just to see, like, Daraja, for example. When I wrote that two months ago, she had childcare and she had a job mm. as a nurse and now she doesn't. So now she's a home healthcare worker, which just is like, you know, racking up the time. It's just one of those dead end jobs. And that's a big story. I mean, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's, that's the thing that, um, I wish that that stuff wasn't invisible. Um, there's also stuff like um, the court, all of the, the situations that domestic violence survivors have to deal with in court. And actually you could see that in a big story with, with the Johnny Depp trial, like the way that that all went down. I mean, 
but if you don't have money and you don't have influence, like it's even, it's just crazy. So there's so many big stories. Um, and wait, so you're- But you're grounding them. You're grounding yeah. them in these stories of yeah, everyday life. of just everyday life. Right. Um, it's almost like, yeah. And I kind of feel like they're celebrities. Mm. <laughs> like I walk in into the situation and I'm hearing their, I mean, maybe it's just because I'm following and I'm thinking mm -hmm. about how to create work about them. But, I, you know, just to see how the big story of systemic oppression works on them every week is, you know, un unbelievable. Um, so, yeah, I mean, is it, I really want to keep telling those stories. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's um, because, and I wish, I don't know, how does that become a big story? <laughs> I think it's you telling it, yeah. honestly. In some ways, it's the, it, you know, my question had to do more with the external pressures of publishing, yeah, yeah. right? And the pacing of publishing. Right. And in some ways, how your work is one of the forces to shift that for our current generation of cartoonists, right? Like versus, there was a sense that diary comics were too small of a story, yeah. and that we needed to tell these huge stories about larger political movements. But now, your work and the work of others who've come up since the zine revolution, right, yeah. are telling, I don't wanna say domestic, because that sounds like domestic work, but stories that are of everyday life, yeah. right? But I also think, like, like part of my idea of working with the town with the domestic violence survivors is that yeah they all have big gigantic mm -hmm. stories but it but it also boils down to um, everybody's story mm -hmm. as well like um, like this idea the last time I was there we were all having body talk conversations about everybody felt like they were fat or whatever and and I was thinking wow this this influence of, of our culture never stops and mm -hmm. it's people never feel like they can you know they've attained something and you know it's oh, it's not <laughs> even when all they need is this time to be safe they're worried about their body right they're worried about like appearances versus safety yeah yeah you know you, you in your opening you talked about how you've been trying to work on the the, the second book of a two-book deal, because the first book was Girl Stories, which yeah. I didn't mention in the introduction, but if you haven't read it, it's fantastic, you know, foundational work in Lauren's career and also in our, our publishing, you know, period, I think, for comics. It really is, it's a beautiful book. But you haven't, you've, you've tried to come back to it again and again, it always feels like you're saying, like, I haven't done it now. But you've done all this other work in the meantime, mm -hmm. this work with Town Clock, this uh, work with Mother's Walk that's gotten and reached an audience. Mm -hmm. So what's made that the right work for you to do right now? And how does it, how does it inform the other work that you've been having ongoing? Uh, and you touch on this, but maybe we can talk more about it. Like, what is it about writing about being a mother that helps you write about being a child, like being mothered? I think it's creating a distance. Mm -hmm. it's, it's packing my childhood up, and that was then and this is now. And um, I actually just, ha I've been having real difficulty planning my daughter's bat mitzvah, <laughs> uh, as I said, I'll probably talk about it a lot. But um, I actually just made an appointment with the clergy because I was like, hey, my bat mitzvah was really traumatic. I kind of hated everything about it. I need a new role here. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe it was just because it was the first time I had a panic attack. <laughs> like maybe it was maybe it has nothing to do with religion, maybe it has something to do with religion. But I, if you pin me down on anything about Judaism, I'm not like Ugh, I could take or leave. Um, <laughs> so, but maybe it was just this first systemic overload. Mm. <laughs> um, and so, it's helping me package things up. It really is. And um, so that's that's kind of where I'm thinking coming from right now. How has your actual drawing changed in the time that you've been doing this work as a mother and an artist? Um, it's, it's loosened up a lot. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out how to be more direct and faster. Um, I, I mean, I don't know, it depends. It, the thing is that right now I'm kind of doing whatever the hell I want to with a book. That's my big <laughs> idea and so if there's like a dream sequence I'll just change it into colored pencil because I was mm -hmm. working in colored pencil for a little while if I want to try and do part of it on my iPad I can too um, so things have really kind of uh, I've changed 
styles, and but I feel like I can, because why not? Like comics, there's always this thing about people being really consistent, and why not change it up? People can figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> You mean the reader, like the, yeah, the reader, reader can figure it out? <laughs> yeah, the reader will be able to figure it out. How are we doing on time? I forgot to bring, where's our timekeeper? 15 minutes? Oh, cool. Okay. okay, so maybe you and I can do more, one more question, yeah. and then I do want to give people in the audience a chance to ask questions. Um, I wanted to ask you this very like, sort of teacherly question, but it's something I'm curious about. Is there a moment in your art life where you faced a challenge that felt like, I I can't get past this in, in doing this work. And then, like, what actually changed? Like, what surprised you? Um, hmm. <laughs> and it can be the pandemic, which I think is you kind of go over this in your talk. But. Yeah, I mean, I've always, I actually feel like right now, if I'm going to be totally honest, I feel like right now I've hit kind of, I'm, I always used to chase shiny objects, mm. like, um, uh, like get something in the New Yorker. Um, and that always took time away from my graphic novel. Mm -hmm. And so, and then I would teach and that would take time away from my graphic novel. And so I'm actively trying to quit all of those things. And I feel like I've hit rock bottom. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for coming. And, uh, but, uh, but, but, in that way, all I can do is just work on my graphic right. novel because, like, that's all signs point to that. Like, mm -hmm. I, um, so that's uh, it's kind of like now. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's now. Like, I <laughs> <laughs> it's right now. Um, so yeah, I don't know. That and the salads. I was saying outside, like you know, the salads. Yeah, when you've gone to salads, it's. Time. <laughs> She's just showing off then. <laughs> She's like, it's really hard being mother. I did make these salads. <laughs> well, I got really, you know what? I'll always find something to distract myself because I got really into gardening when I moved to New mm -hmm. Jersey. I was like, okay, I'm in New Jersey. I have to be like the world's greatest gardener now. But <laughs> now, like this year, there was a drought and nothing grew. So I'm like, fuck this. Now I have to draw my book. <laughs> okay, let's get some questions for Lauren. Does anybody have a question and want to go over to the mic? I have microphones on both sides of the room. You can come up and ask your questions. Anyone? Oh, here's, here's a question. Here's a question. You want to go up to the mic? Maybe we can have it come down to you. Here we go. I have more questions here. So. You don't have any questions. Um, hi. I was just wondering, it does sound like you were able to kind of tell these big stories from your daily life. And you talked about the idea of the antenna, having the antenna on all the time. And I'm wondering if you have some kind of process where you're like, yeah, I should really look into this. I should really focus on this idea. I think it's going to bring me somewhere or, or not. Because I feel like it sounds like you're like very attentive to you know, your life and your family and what goes around you. But at the same time, like you're able to make that universal. And I wonder, like, how do you decide, yes, I'm going to go for this one and not for mm -hmm. another one? Well, badly, because I'm always taking on these new things. But, um, <laughs> but, but I also, um, uh, I don't know. When there's something really intriguing about a story that I just can't, like the fire burning the, the church down that the residents of Town Clock, I was like, that's like a no-brainer. Like, I got to take that one mm. on. Um, but other small things, like um, what I'm doing right now, actually, that's really helpful. Um, and I think this is one of those, like, rock-bottom things, is uh, I'm taking, I printed out panel paper. And every morning, I wake up with a lot of anxiety. And I just write, kind of like, I don't know if you guys have heard of the writer's way where you like do three pages of something. So I started writing, and I'm like, wait, I'm a cartoonist. Like, why am I writing? And so I started just doing it on panel paper. And having this backlog recorded has been fantastic, because that allows me, when I have a little more time, to go back to it and say, oh, that's interesting, and that's interesting. Because certain things won't be, are kind of good as a story, but then they're not good as a comic. And so you really have to see how it looks on paper. Um, 
uh, before. You know. Do you mean you're writing about what you're anxious about, or are you writing about memory? Like you wake up and try, and you have a memory. It's whatever. Okay. I, I try and not do any. I try and not put any um, any you know uh, limits limits, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. limits on it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, just just shout it out. It's How okay. Are you? So thank you for your talk. I, your art is very beautiful. Thanks. Um, I was wondering if there was any, like, if you had any advice for your younger self writing about your life and making comments about your life, you know, what would you want to say? Younger self? I mean, I'm like 25. Um, uh, <laughs> the, um, <laughs> the, uh, I don't know what to say. I feel like, I don't. Let's see. Wait. Do you mean younger, my younger self, or like young people? Well, like yourself, and I mean, you yeah, know, you were younger yesterday than today. <laughs> um. Hmm. I don't know. I that means young people, though, right? Because that's like, who we're talking to here <laughs> at SPX. I feel like for <laughs> young people, no different rules than I do, and mm. I'm like, I know that. For, young people have grown up with the internet. And I mean, I did, like, my first comics were on girl.com, and they generated, like, a gajillion responses. Um, and it was a very, very weird thing. Like, I got 10,000 emails once, because I wrote this comic called Am I Fat? And there were, like, a <laughs> bunch of girls. It, it was very intense. Um, and the world has evolved, and I think, with every media platform, you know, people evolve a way of, of talking and making art on it um, that I, I think is, I, I feel like I'm looking at, you know, younger people and seeing how they, how they function online and seeing if it works for me or maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Um, but in terms of my younger self, I don't know. I just feel like I had to make things and do whatever I was doing and I don't know. I don't, I don't want to second guess anything, any of the really bad choices I made. <laughs> yeah, here. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, no, so, it's good. Is it all right? Okay. So um, you talked about the advice you got from Elaine, mm -hmm. which is amazing. And you talked about the way working with the women at Tom Cloth has changed the way you've looked at life. And now you're seeing life in art. And now you're seeing the way these things intersect. And I'm wondering if you look back at your earlier work, do you think you were doing that unconsciously, or do you see a, a mm. strong break between the way you approach art and life before these experiences and the way you approach it since? Hmm. I think the experience of being a parent has been the thing that has changed everything about the world. Like, I can see a break there more than anything else. And unfortunately, the experience of bring, being a parent, like, I could handle my anxiety and pulling all-nighters without kids just fine. It was just like I put that away. and But you can't do that with kids. Like you have to be, um, a, you have to switch. Your mind has to go from this like very internal space to this external space so often. So that's changed the way I approach both things. Like I think that um, being, um, it, I'm always, I always feel like I'm running from one thing to the next thing, and maybe I had that feeling before, but, um, and then, but I think the number one thing is, like, don't beat yourself up, because, like, you also don't want to beat up your kids, I mean, not literally and figuratively, but, you know, like, like uh, if, if that kind of, like, you have to be everything all the time mm -hmm. is, like, such a thing in our society, and um, so I'm, I'm trying not to do that. And I see it in my mom. Uh, again, she was just at the White House helping them sign that, that bill, the infrastructure bill and everything. Like, she's like, you know, but she never stops. And she's like, and it's hard. It's hard to watch. It's hard to watch this incredible person um, have, you know, 
health problems because she's never ever slept because she, the whole thing with her and feminism was you can have it all if you don't sleep so so that's you know that's been the thing that I have tried really tried not to do mm. um, and so yeah one more do we have anyone else here Yeah, oh yeah, there's a lot of stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh Death yeah, watch. it was funny. I was just sitting with Gabrielle Bell and Tara Booth and we all looked at each other and said, um, the best stories are the ones you can't tell. And we all just laughed. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> um, but um, well, in the case of Town Clock, um, there is, there's a lot of stuff I'd like to talk about with one person, but she's in the middle of a gigantic court case. And it literally, like, no. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so yeah, there are always things like that that I'm kind of putting away. And then I'm also seeing how it can be fiction. Because you know what? Fiction is fine. <laughs> like, 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 it doesn't have to, like, I hate this thing where they put a stamp on the memoir where it's like, if it's not super true, I mean, I get like how that's problematic if somebody's like, yeah, I would <laughs> save babies and then they didn't. But, um, but <laughs> if, if the essential truth is there then and you're protecting somebody, then I think that's really, really important um, to be able to, I wish there was more kind of acceptance of that and maybe there is. I the autofiction. Yeah, the autofiction. Yeah. I think autofiction is a way to go. Rachel Massimilani calls it autobiofictionography. Yeah. <laughs> I, but I think she <laughs> took that from Linda Berry. She maybe did. I don't know. Yeah. Well, then, Linda Berry says that. Yeah. Well, if she said it, then. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> it is what it is, right? Uh, yeah. I think that was time. Thank you so much, Lauren. Thank I'm you. such a huge fan. A real honor to talk with you. Thanks. Thank you.